Okay. All right. So, hello, and thanks for coming out to my presentation. My name is Alex Alberti, and I'm a senior music education major at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. My presentation will focus on my studies with a game called 451 that I discovered one day in my junior year. I wanted to see if the game would prove to be a helpful supplement to studies in harmonic function in the traditional music theory classroom. I immediately knew that students today have adopted this different kind of learning. I did some background research on what many so-called millennials need to learn and study successfully in the classroom. Millennials have debated uh, time periods of their arrival across sociological definitions, but from this particular source, we'll say that millennials are learners who are born after 1980. They tend to dislike the traditional method of approaching problems and situations. For example, many students in today's classrooms are quite inattentive to the traditional lecture style and much prefer a more hands-on, socially focused, and peer-influenced classroom setting. When millennials are able to step up and interact and feel in charge of their educational process, they are much more adept to listen and engage in a lesson. A lot of this learning style comes in the form of a social constructivist classroom. Social constructivism is a learning theory that many attribute to Lev Vygotsky. A social constructivist classroom believes that many students learn best from social and group interaction. When students are together and socializing, they produce knowledge and learn best. Vygotsky theorized that this interplay of people cause knowledge to flow freely from one to another first and then internalize as learning afterwards. Social constructivists believe that learning is socially motivated in many students and gameplay or games-based learning certainly embraces the constructivist and extrinsic motivator in this particular type of learner. <coughs> Games-based learning is a method of teaching and interaction in which the student engages in play to gather knowledge. Games work by simulating experiences in a risk-free setting, allowing students to try new things and make mistakes without the consequences of reality. The process by itself is social and competitive influencing the extrinsic motivation in students and boosting their willingness to participate. The learning style is interactive, hands-on, and most importantly, a simplified subset of the real task outside of play. I believe that 451 was the perfect interplay between social constructivism and games-based learning, and a great way to satisfy the desires of millennial learners. 451 is a card game by Rafael Hernandez, which seeks to imitate the process of voice leading and harmonic motion by way of a card game. Below, you'll see a typical phrase that can be built in one round of gameplay. That's kind of what's going on down here. Yeah. <laughs> the objective of the game is to build the best phrase possible with the given twists and turns of part writing errors and style cards. Each card has a point value assigned, which are given to the player when they play one of their phrases. A typical goal would be to reach 50 points before the end of the game, taking as many rounds and cadences until someone reaches this point limit. The game is simply one deck of cards that I will pass around for everyone to look at and shuffle through. So, um, these two stacks are actually one deck, so I'm going to kind of pass them from the front and back, and you can like, look through them and kind of read through what's going on. <laughs> there are several types of cards in the deck. Each would serve an excellent pedagogical function during gameplay that are masked by fun and the competitiveness of the activity. The first are harmony cards, the bread and butter of the game. These cards are connected together in chains to create phrases and rack up points. Each card contains the Roman numeral with appropriate diatonic capitalization, and a box below the numeral which contains all possible ways for the card to function within the phrase. So this will tell you, for example, tonic can go to subdominant or dominant. Uh, they can go back and forth. They can only go here, and it actually tells you exactly what comes afterwards. Um, this is where I find the most important feature of the game. It is through constant gameplay and observation of these little boxes that I have rejuvenated my knowledge in how chords can flow from one to the next. This feature is highlighted by a great color coding system that matches blue to tonic chords, red to dominant chords, and yellow to subdominant chords. Aside from seeing the boxes that show harmonic flow, this color system really helps learners visually see how functional harmony is grouped into these families. It's even great to see the 1-6-4 chord showing up red to show that it's typically grouped with the 5 chord. Many beginning learners may only assimilate the 1 chord at a time. 
As these are grouped together appropriately, on the top and bottom of each card are appropriate soul vegetables. Uh, if you get a voice leading card, and you can attach them to the soprano or bass of a chord, like up here or down here, um, you'll get extra points for doing that. And these suitably match up with, the, with each card's inversion. For example, we have Fa on the bottom of the third inversion, 5 7 chord. These are special harmony cards that can be inserted into the middle of a phrase. These inject extra points into a player's uh, game database. Um, and aside from typical diatonic chords, they also have advanced special six chords, like Neapolitan's or Augmented Six, right here. What I find best about these, besides their use of altered scale degrees in the voice leading section, is its way to show how each flow and group together as either subdominant, as in the case of the Neapolitan, or dominant Italian chords. I know personally, these have definitely helped fill a memory gap from when I learned six chords in theory two. Uh, these are special harmony cards as well. Um, they give you extra points, and some of the common ones are like common tone diminished seventh chords, which I didn't really know what those were at first, but they go one common tone diminished seventh, one chord, which I thought was pretty cool, and then movement by fifth. And it's kind of just like extra ways to uh, look at the harmonic function going and add extra points into that. After you've completed a phrase, you collect your points by locking it down with a cadence card. These cards teach the typical cadences in functional music, authentic, half deceptive, and playable. The card also displays the typical Roman numeral motion in the phrase to aid a player, but also have colors to help reinforce the necessary flow of harmony. This is, again, a great way for visual learners to grasp the concept of cadences. The competitive nature of the game comes in the form of part writing errors. If you've got a great phrase going on, and you're about to lock in a 30-point group, your high can be quickly extinguished when your friend lays three part writing errors on your harmonies. To correct these errors, a player must find the exact same harmonies affected and replace them down onto the board. These will really help reinforce some of those cardinal sins in part writing to teach students who may ignore them otherwise. I think it's kind of fun also to see friends yelling at each other about an untimely part writing error placed on two high scoring harmonies, which often happens. <laughs> and these are the um, voice leading cards that you would attach on top or bottom of a harmony card. They match up with the dominant coloring or like tonic coloring, so red or blue or yellow. And they also have altered scale degrees for like uh, um, Italian chords or Neapolitan chords. Finally, we have style cards. What a style card does is place the players in a period of music history, each with a consequence about how their phrases and harmonies can function. For example, the Baroque card places a high penalty for any kind of part writing error that may be on your phrase, uh, indicative of Bach's strict rules for voice leading in motion. Consequently, a player can also play a 20th century card to negate the Baroque card and negate all part writing errors and get extra points for having <laughs> part writing errors. Okay? That's pretty cool. These cards are a great way to supplement music history knowledge. So here you can see a typical phrase that you can have it around. So you have them um, going across the board, so tonic goes to subdominant, and then special harmony, and then like one, six, four, group with five, so it all kind of flows naturally. And uh, here's your cadence that locks in all your points. They have um, the voice leading cards on top of the harmony cards. There's one of those nasty part writing errors, which no one likes. Um, so that's kind of how your, your hand in front of you would look. This pilot study of how this game works in the music classroom was conducted at my university using a very small sample of about six students from music industry class. I wanted to see if this game would help their understanding of the harmonic function unit in their curriculum. The plan was to assign a short pretest, play the game with them several times, and then assign a post-test to see if their knowledge had improved. The pilot study, oh, excuse me, as an undergraduate, this proved to be a difficult task. Due to the small size of the sample group and time constraints due to cancellations and absences, the exposure to the game was very brief, with some students only playing it once for about 30 minutes. I was only able to play the game twice total with the students overall before the post-test was needed to be given. Due to the lack of real exposure of the game, this small study received no telling quantitative information about its impact on test performance with harmonic function. However, the qualitative data gained from the post-study survey was invaluable. This student, after participating, said that the game boosted his confidence when discussing theoretical knowledge. He recognized a great use for the game both inside and outside of the classroom, feeling very compelled to keep playing even when class was over. 
This student also experienced a great boost in confidence and looked forward to playing it as the highlight of his day. <laughs> really, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> These students also benefited from the game. The first student loved the competitive, challenging aspect of the process and loved being able to take theory oh, excuse me, outside of summative assessments. And she was one of the ones who would yell across the table when you put a party in her, her phrase, so she was pretty fun. The other enjoyed learning about the flow and order of harmonic function from the activity. From the short study, I have deducted many possible pedagogical benefits from the playing of 451. It immediately matches many of the needs of millennials, allowing hands-on learning in a social and competitive atmosphere that breaks the traditional norms of practicing or studying music theory. This gives a great appeal to the game pedagogically. Kinesthetic and visual learners will gain a lot from playing it, as it allows them to visualize and assign color to function, as well as get the sensation of physically moving and rearranging a phrase. For our learners, it would be great to benefit and play piano as each phrase is being built, to hear the way it sounds, naturally flowing from one chord to the next. Students will also jump on the opportunity to help take charge of their peers learning by participating. Because this game is risk-free and forgiving, it's okay for students to take risks when playing. However, just as easily as one may make a mistake, another student may jump in and say, wait, that's not right, you can't play that, you have to go from this to this. From my observations, students are quick to help correct errors and are, con <laughs> and are constantly on the lookout for them. Also, the game is quite affordable and a great addition for schools on budget. Supporting the games-based learning philosophy, the game is a simplified version of the real harmonic dictation and part writing. This allows students to grasp the larger picture before dealing with the details. It's a great addition to tutoring labs for extra practice. It can aid in music history review to an extent, and students will beg it to play it outside of class with friends. Even I played it with several friends who aren't music majors in my hometown, and they beat me. <laughs> if you have any more questions about the game or my study, please contact me with this email. That one. Uh, also, my mentor, Dr. Snodgrass, would love to talk about the way she uses it in our university tutoring lab and in her theory classes. That one. <laughs> to do more personal research about the game, you can visit 451.com. Make sure it's Roman numerals and you have the dashes. And thank you for your time. A little over five minutes for question and answer. Where can you get the card? Uh, on the um, website right here, you can order it. Also, musicteachertools.com, I believe, also has the, the card game. Um, I believe my professor spoke with the creator of the game, and he supplied our school with a pretty good deal for our tutoring lab with a couple different decks. Yes? Um, first off, I think this is the coolest thing ever. It's so cool, I promise. Um, <laughs> uh, just going back to like being a constructivist teacher, uh -huh. um, and have you thought of a way to develop a curriculum where instead of this being... Uh, like on a lot of your quotes, it's like it was a refresher mm -hmm. or a review of what we're doing in class mm -hmm. rather than uh, like incorporating it as the actual teaching thing. Have you developed some kind of curriculum where this is like the main thing teaching harmony? Well, one cool thing you could probably do is if you're introducing um, part writing and you're starting with just like one and five, what you can do is take the one and five. Let's see if I can. You can maybe just take all the cards out of the deck except these and have like a dot cam or some way to display and say, okay, so here's a one chord. It's built like this. So as you can see, it's tonic and you can assign that color to blue. And you can kind of explain the card as it goes. You can say, okay, because one of the tonic chord, you can say it can go to a dominant chord. For example, a five can function as dominant. And if you take the cards and sort of actively almost play the game in front of them, the way these, these are laid out and the way you can go from one card to the next naturally and explains all the rules on the card. That'd be a great way to develop it. And as you advance more through your theory and you want to start adding Neapolitan and Italian chords, you put those back in the deck. And so you're back at the dot cam again, playing it, and say, okay, look, so we have a one chord and it goes subdominant. So if we have this Neapolitan chord, it functions as subdominant. So that's kind of where you can play that. And I know personally that would help me a lot to just visually see it play out in front of me. Other questions? Yes. Have you had the opportunity to play the game or observe playing the game with younger age groups like high school, middle school? I think I think the oldest I've done is high school. And uh, and like I said, one of the great things about this game is that you really don't don't need to know a lot about theory to play it. I played with Lucy today and she's not a music major. <laughs> and she totally she was getting it almost immediately, picking it up because like I said, every card has every instruction you're gonna need on it. 
<coughs> so um, I think it'd be great for any age group. I'd say high school might be um, the youngest you might want to go, or really, maybe really advanced eighth graders. But I don't think this is really, um, it would be really helpful for eighth graders just yet. Other questions? Go ahead. Do you aspire to be a music teacher? Absolutely, yes. And learning, you know, uh, getting these alternate ways of teaching and uh, getting people more socially active in the classroom is one of my philosophies and biggest goals as a teacher. How are you going to grade them? Um, this is probably more of a, a formative assessment, so kind of walking around the class. If you could buy a couple, a couple class sets and have them play, you can kind of walk around and see how each student is thinking about it because a lot of times when a student's playing, they're kind of engulfed in it. So you see them move their cards around their hand and start thinking about, okay, how are they, how are they envisioning this flow? Are they, are they taking risks? Or are they just kind of looking around at what other people are doing? So just by observing them play in this you know, subset of the real thing, you can assess them formatively like that. In the, in the spirit of that generation, I mean that being one, um, these things are real popular. Is there an electronic app that would be able to use that? Because it seems like seems to me that that would be so right for now. Um, I don't think he's developed an electronic version yet. He does have a, an app out. He is a the creator has a Solfege app where it relates Solfege syllables back to the Kodai hand signs, oh. and it helps with. Um, harmonic memory, so it'll, or melodic memory, so it'll play a m melody and you have to go back and recreate it with the hand signs on the app. So, so he does have that, the capability, yeah, he, so hasn't, he hasn't made this for electronic <coughs> just yet. Yes? So how do you correct the part writing errors? Is there... So, okay, for example, what was that little example phrase you had? So if I wanted to correct, there's a parallel fist between these two chords. If I wanted to correct them, I have to get the exact same cards, a one and a four, and place them back on top. So it's almost like you rewrote the chord. Mm -hmm. and, then you, and then you'll get the points back. Huh. Yeah. That's the... If you, if, you have, if you need a one chord, but you've got to play it back there, you're like, oh, I want to use the one chord, but I kind of correct my error that I didn't do, that Trevor put on my phrase. Yeah, exactly. Any final questions? Cool, thank you very much.